Hi everyone. Uh, so this is a fun change. Um, since I had to cancel class the week before Thanksgiving, I am coming to you virtually to make sure that we don't have to rush through this lesson in class on Tuesday. Um, I really want to make sure that you all get all of the information that you need in order to understand diversity in organizations because it's a pretty important topic. Um, I also figure this video can be another resource for you as you're going back through notes, studying for final exams and all that fun stuff. Um, so just in case you're not familiar, the little cog wheel down at the bottom of the YouTube player will let you speed me up as you see fit if you need to do that. Um, on your keyboard, the left and right arrows will let you skip forwards or backwards five seconds. Um, might be useful if you miss something or you need to hear something again. So with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. So part of what I'll be going over in this video is a re review of and adding on to Dr. Poole's lecture. But I'm going to focus in on a few of the concepts that you definitely need to know for your final, plus adding a little bit of context so that you really have an understanding of how this stuff works. All right. So um, to start us off, the enemy of diversity and bias is or the enemy of diversity is bias and prejudice. So these are kind of the forces at work. Um, against creating or maintaining a diverse organization. So um, in order to really examine diversity in organizations, we have to start by looking at how biases and prejudices are formed, right? So um, people have two main types of identity. You have your individual identity. So this is um, unique personal characteristics or experiences or accomplishments like um, I am a PhD student or I am tall. Um, you also have group identity. So these are groups that we associate ourselves with, right? I am an Illini or I am a union member. Um, when we take that identity and it collides with socialization, this is part of how we learn kind of categories. So socialization is defined by the groups that we're in, but also by groups that we don't belong to. So socialization is what fosters in-group and out-group thinking. Um, so write this down. This is important. Uh, social identity theory tells us that we define our own social identity in terms of both the groups we belong to and the groups that we do not belong to. So moving past socialization, we get to social categorization. So this is the process of determining which groups people belong to. Um, for example, someone wearing a MAGA hat, if you see someone like that, you might assume they are Republican, that they're conservative, that they're religious, maybe they support strict immigration. Or on the other hand, if you see someone with a Planned Parenthood bumper sticker, you might assume that they vote Democrat, that they support the right to choose. Uh, maybe you assume it's a woman's car. So the point here is that these assumptions or stereotypes kind of create identification and opposition. So they create ideas and people that we identify with and the people that we oppose or don't identify with. So let's put this kind of into the context of organizations. So we have groups that we identify with and groups that we don't. But um, even with the best intentions, discrimination still happens. Um, Within organizations, for example, we can intentionally include, exclude someone or overtly discriminate against them, um, but we have workplace discrimination laws that try to protect individuals from this type of discrimination, um, this type of intentional kind of overt discrimination based on age, disability, religion, race, gender identity, all of that stuff. But um, a lot of discrimination that happens in organizational contexts is something that we do unintentionally. It's this idea that um, birds of a feather flock together. We're more comfortable with people like us. Um, so when we see a group of people, who do we sit next to? Usually, uh, we choose someone who reminds us of ourselves in some way. Um, this can mean that we avoid forming relationships or empowering others that we don't identify with. 
So it may be because um, we don't know what we would say to someone different, or we assume we don't have anything in common. Uh, there are cultural differences we don't understand, anything like that. Um, but when we take our social identity, our idea of groups we belong to and groups we don't belong to, this is what leads to we versus they or us versus them polarization. Um, for example, when all of the young workers in the office go out to lunch together, but don't invite the two boomers in the office, they just leave them at the office to be sad using Internet Explorer all alone. This develops we they polarization. Um, and things are likely to get worse between those two groups, especially if there's already resentment there. Um, so finally, we come to this idea of homosocial reproduction. And again, this is something that uh, Dr. Poole talked about in his lecture, but um, it's an important concept for you guys to understand, so I'm going to go over it quickly. Well, maybe. Okay, um, so homosocial reproduction is this idea that managers tend to form organizations and teams and stuff like that in their own image um, and this is usually something that happens unconsciously but over and over and over again research has found that managers use social similarity um, as a basis for selection and promotion within organizations they choose people similar to themselves um, they tend to choose people that are of a similar ethnicity, similar values, similar backgrounds, even like similar ways of dressing. Um, and unless we're conscious and aware of this, we're gonna keep choosing people like us. Managers pick people like themselves for a few reasons, but kind of the big overarching reason that you guys need to know is that um, this mentality that, hey, I've been successful in my position, so I'm gonna choose someone kind of like me and they'll also probably be successful. If um, we have the same values and the same ideas and the same background, you know, all of these things helped me succeed, they'll help this next person succeed too. So um, people tend towards those who are similar to them. But um, what kind of ripple effects might this have? Even if we just favor people like us just a little bit, um, there's this really cool software called NetLogo, which is free to download if this is something you guys are at all interested in. Um, so I'll bring that up really quick. So this is um, a simulation that's going to show us kind of how these smaller preferences tend to ripple out. So this is a simul simulation of a neighborhood with two groups of people or agents, uh, blue and orange. So what you're seeing here is the neighborhood that they all live in together. So the orange agents and the blue agents, they get along with one another, but um, each agent wants to make sure that it lives near some of its own. Um, so that means, you know, each orange guy wants to live near at least some other orange guys, and each blue guy wants to live near at least some other blue guys. Um, the simulation uh, shows us kind of how these individual preferences ripple through the neighborhood, leading to larger scale patterns. So I'll show you kind of how it works. This uh, percent similar wanted um, slider right here, this controls the um, percentage of same color agents that each agent kind of wants among its neighbors. So for example, right now the slider is set at 30. So that means that each blue agent wants at least 30% of its neighbors to be blue doesn't seem too crazy. So um, when I click set up right here, the orange and blue agents are kind of randomly distributed throughout the neighborhood. But if we look here, we have, you know, a pretty decent number of agents that are unhappy because they don't have enough same color neighbors. Right now, the um, percent similar is around 50%, but these unhappy people are going to want to move in order to get to at least 30%, right? So um, when I start the simulation, I'm just going to have it tick once. The unhappy agents move to new locations kind of in their vicinity. And then in these new locations, they might tip the balance of the local population, prompting other agents to leave. So if a few agents move into an area, 
uh, orange agents, the local blue guys might leave. When the blue agents move, that might prompt orange people to leave. So over time, though, we have the number of unhappy agents decreasing. So this is good. People are moving. People are finding um, that 30, at least 30 percent similarity. Um, in the case where each agent wants at least 30 percent of same color neighbors, the agents end up with kind of on average about 70 percent same color neighbors. So this is a little bit different every time you run it um, because it's randomized at the beginning, but it always ends up around 70 percent. Um, remember, the agents just wanted like three out of it's 10 neighbors to be like them. So that's not too crazy, right? But the way it works out in practice is that when everyone wants 30% of their neighbors to be like them, um, you actually end up with upwards of 70% of neighbors uh, that are similar. So um, relatively small individual preferences can lead to really significant overall segregation. Um, even relatively small unconscious preferences can ripple out into um, kind of much bigger segregation and less diversity. So uh, keep in mind what this little arrangement looks like here in our simulated neighborhood and I will show you something else. So this looks kind of like a more complex version of that, right? This is a map of Chicago. Um, each dot represents one person and the dots are color coded by race. So these patterns um, kind of ripple out into the real world. Even if you want only like 30 percent of your neighbors to be like you, it's going to end up a lot more segregated than that. So if this is something that you find kind of interesting or you want to play around with that map a little bit more, um, you have a chance to do that and get engagement points for it. Wow. Um, so this is just to make up for the engagement points that you all didn't get a chance to have in class. Um, but there's another opportunity. It's up on Moodle right now if you need some more points for quarter four. Um, it's a pretty easy and interesting 10 points. Shouldn't take you more than like 15 or 20 minutes. Um, the slides and instructions are up in Moodle. So go check that out. All right, so moving on, um, one of the big advantages to a diverse work group, one of the reasons why this really, really matters beyond just like, oh, diversity is good, which it is, but one reason why it's really cool is that an increase in diversity in a work group has been found to enhance problem solving. So a bunch of different research projects um, have shown a whole bunch of different ways that um, diverse work groups tend to um, have advantages so long as that diversity is kind of acknowledged, effectively dealt with. But taken together, all three of these show us that an increase in diversity of a work group, work group has been found to enhance problem solving. So that's the big takeaway that I want you to get from this. So here are kind of some behaviors and actions that might indicate an organization is not as diverse or multicultural as they might claim to be. So again, an organization probably is adhering to anti-discrimination laws, hopefully, um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't discrimination going on unintentionally. Um, so first of all, there's um, pay gap. So women of color make significantly less than their white counterparts as well as their male counterparts. Um, I'll kind of spare you from it here. But if you ever want to talk about wage gaps, especially if you're um, of the mind that they're not a real thing, um, I love explaining this to people and I love talking about this stuff. So feel free to ask me about it. Um, but the two things that I want to focus in on that you guys really need to understand. Um, are informal integration and tokenism. So um, informal integration or informal network access, um, so this is when minority culture members are included in informal networks and activities outside of normal working hours. So who is invited out to golf with the boss on the weekends? Um, who's going to company picnics? 
So informal integration is a really important part of integration and diversity. This tells us like who is really welcome, who really feels like they belong, um, how are how integrated are we informally? Um, the other concept you guys really need to know is tokenism. So tokenism is when you are a really highly visible representative of your gender or ethnicity or whatever trait makes you kind of a minority in the organization. So for example, if you're the only Latinx person in your work group, you might be expected to always represent the Latinx viewpoint. Um, one of the big problems with tokenism is called the paradox of visibility. So this is a concept that you'll definitely need to know. Um, let's say that NASA hires a woman for the flight control room. Um, she's a very visible representation of women. She is the token woman in this flight control room. The paradox of visibility means that um, because she's so visible, she now represents like all women in science, for example. So if she screws up, um, she makes women in science look bad. If she screws up, you know, what if NASA says, oh, women suck at science, no more hiring women. Um, another kind of sort of related example is the recent Ghostbusters movie. Um, what was unique about it? It was an all female cast. So they're representing women, they are tokens, and they're very visible. If the movie sucks, which it did, um, now because of the paradox of visibility, people are saying it sucked because it starred women and because it had a whole cast of women. Um, the paradox of visibility says, you know, ru women ruined my movie. Um, when perhaps in reality, that movie would have sucked if it starred dudes too. Like there were a whole lot of problems with that movie. But um, because of their increased visibility, token minorities are expected to represent all other members of their minority group. And that's a whole lot of pressure, right? So um, informal integration and the paradox of visibility, two important concepts that you all will need to understand. All right, so um, this is just an infographic that I thought some of you might find kind of interesting or useful. I've put the full thing in our Moodle page um, in the Diversity Week tab if you want to check it out. This is just a small part of it. But um, essentially, diversity and inclusion are really cool. They're really important. But there's a deeper level that we need to ultimately be aiming for. So rather than asking, um, do we have enough minorities? on our board. The more important question is why? So what conditions are present here in this organization to make it so that certain groups always tend to be in the majority? So it's aiming to get at the underlying kind of systemic issues. Um, things like affirmative action are great and they're absolutely necessary, but they're a band-aid, right? Um, which again is great. Band-aids are really important short term, but long term, it's really important to address kind of the underlying issue that makes that band-aid necessary. So um, if that's something that's, that interests you, go check out this infographic or this um, essay. It's super interesting. So um, to kind of wrap up, here are the core concepts that um, when you close out of this video, I want you to have like a decent understanding of. So first of all, um, social identity theory. Social identity theory says that we create our own social identity from the groups that we belong to and the groups that we do not belong to. Uh, second is homosocial reproduction. This is the idea that people have a tendency to hire or promote people like themselves because they assume that since they succeeded at an organization, this other person who's similar will also have what it takes to succeed in the organization. 
Um, understand that small biases create larger effects. So that simulation taught us that um, even a really low kind of small bias towards people similar to us ripple out and end up having a much larger effect when that really small bias is held by everyone. Um, fourth, understand that um, an increase in diversity of a work group has been found to enhance problem solving. So diverse work groups are better at solving problems. Um, fifth, we have informal integration. So this is when minority culture members are integrated into the social activities and other activities that happen kind of outside of the formal workplace. This leads to kind of access to informal networks. And then finally, we have the paradox of visibility. This is when um, someone is the only member of a minority group, um, which means that their visibility leads to um, those people being seen as representing every member of that minority group. So um, just a few reminders to wrap up. Um, the online engagement opportunity is posted to Moodle. Um, it's due December 10th, so you've got a little bit of time to um, get that done. You all have been um, very understanding and patient with me in the last kind of few crazy weeks. So um, I am more than happy to extend that understanding and patience to you all as far as deadlines go. Um, in class on Tuesday, we'll be going over technological processes. So as usual, you've got the quiz due before class, um, Sunday forum as usual. Um, I was also wondering if there's an interest in kind of extra credit opportunities, um, probably like points added to like your lowest test score, I'm thinking. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I'll, we'll probably talk about that in class on Tuesday. Um, and finally, exams are in just a couple weeks. This last part of the semester went by super quick. Um, I'd also like to know if there's any interest in kind of an extra review session. Um, so we'll spend a little bit of time in class doing review um, on our last week, but we kind of have a whole lot we have to uh, cover. Well, we don't have a ton we have to cover that day, but we, I won't be able to dedicate the whole class to exam review. So I was wondering if there was interest in me holding kind of an extra review session, maybe on reading day on Thursday, um, as long as the department will let me do that. I'll have to check with them. But I was thinking it'll be just like an hour and a half or so. Um, you guys can come and go as you'd like. Um, I'll bring snacks and stuff and I'll go over, I'll answer questions, kind of go over the study guide, um, go over practice questions, stuff like that. So um, again, we'll talk about that in class on Tuesday more probably, but let me know if you're interested in that. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving break and I'm looking forward to seeing you all on Tuesday.